too. Okay, Tammy, are you here? Where's Tammy? Would you mind coming up and making an announcement about this? You know so much more about this than I do. So I want to introduce you ladies to Tammy. She's going to tell you a little bit about, there's a flyer um, that's in the, at the table, the snack table, and she's going to let you know a little bit about it. Um, I'm an eccentrics instructor at the uh, Cultural Arts Center and Community Center in Yorba Linda. And I started coming to this church, and I thought it would be fun to introduce eccentrics to everyone here, all the ladies. It's for all ages. Um, eccentrics is stretching and strengthening and rebalancing our body, getting some height. If you have poor posture, it helps you out. It's just lubricating all the joints and getting all the fluids going in your body because we get atrophy. Oh, if yeah. We don't. So I thought it'd be fun. They have the most beautiful gym here. And I thought, you know what? Can we have some eccentrics here for you all? All you need is a yoga mat, some comfortable clothing, maybe a small pillow or a towel for under your neck. It's nothing that not one of you could not do. And it's all just really good for you. When is it? It's stretching and strengthening. No, is it when? It's called eccentrics. It was out of Canada. Um, It'll, she was asking when. Oh, when it when? Is. It's yeah. October 20th on Friday morning and October 27th on Friday morning. We thought we would just try it yeah. and see who comes. And it'll be here? It's here in the gym. Oh, that's awesome. Okay, yeah. so if you have any questions, are you in a group, Tammy? No, I'm not. Okay, but if you... I'll wait. Yeah. What time? Yeah. What? what time? At, at uh, 9 a.m. in the morning. Okay, I'm going to stop everybody here for just a second. So if you have a question, because I want to get started, if you have a question, grab Tammy at the end. She'll be happy to do it. Yeah. Thanks, Tammy. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Okay, yeah, I'm at 635, and I don't want to run too far over. I know I can. All right, so let's uh, go before the Lord and invite him into our evening. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that we can come boldly into your throne of grace, Lord, that we can ask for help in times of trouble, Lord, and you know exactly what we need before we even ask for it, but you tell us to come and you tell us to seek and ask and knock. And so we are tonight, Lord. Pray that you would help us to lay aside any cares, any worries that we might have tonight, Lord, that we might come into your presence and find peace, Lord, that we might sit at your feet and just draw from you those things that you would have us to know. If there's anything, any sin that's creating a separation, I pray that you would reveal that to us, Lord, that you would convict us of that, and then help us to repent from it, Lord. And if there's a decision that needs to be made, we pray that you would give us great wisdom according to the power of your spirit. And we pray this in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. So a couple announcements. First, I do want to thank a lot of you ladies that... Um, uh, supported the Hope Restored India fashion show, whether that was through prayer or whether that was through attendance or if you donated. I just want to say thank you so much. I also do want to let you know that next week we are having a sandwich supper. It's very informal. We're just going to have some sandwiches and some chips and snacks and things. So that's going to be starting at 6 o'clock, and it'll be going until 6.30 when we have our study. So you can come a little early, and you can get a sandwich if you'd like. Um, let's see, our last study, I can't believe how fast this has gone, our last study in James is next Monday. So we will be Lesson 6, Chapter 5, but that's not the end of Monday meetings. We have three speakers, it's a series called Testify, and we have three speakers, three ladies that are coming out to tell their God story. On the 23rd, it's Cynthia Banerjee. On October 30th, it is Stacy Richards. And on November 6th, it is our own Diana Drake. And I have heard a lot about what I wish I was going to be here. I'm going to watch it online. I'm very excited about that. Um, but you need to be here because I think it's going to be an amazing, powerful experience. Um, so please uh, make sure you return. So again, tonight we are in James chapter 4. This is lesson 5. We are clicking right along. Good evening, ladies. Hi. Sorry. <laughs> oh, you're not being, I didn't take attendance yet, so you're good. 
Well, if you remember, uh, last week we ended with James telling us the difference between worldly wisdom and God's wisdom. Proverbs 14, 12 tells us that there is a way that seems right to man, but the end thereof is death. Now, I have lived 60 decades, gosh, that sounds so old, on this earth, and with each decade, maybe you've noticed, has come some new source or some new revelation of the world's wisdom. Uh, we have been told by those in the field of nutrition that we aren't supposed to eat eggs. They're bad for us, and then they decide that they're good for us. Uh, coffee was bad, and then coffee was good. Uh, then we have been told we need to follow the science, and yet we find that science, that is science that is man-made, is not always foolproof, and the fact is it is often even dead wrong. Here's a few examples. I just like to look these things up. In 1884, an Austrian ophthalmologist named Karl Kroller was pushing the benefits of using cocaine to anesthetize his patients during surgery. He even sold it in the Sears catalog, <laughs> marketing it as a treatment for toothaches, I would imagine, depression, sinusitis, lethargy, alcoholism, and even impotence. This was the new wonder drug. It was even, it was being sold as a tonic in lozenge and powders and even used in cigarettes. Now, of course, over time, it was discovered that the side effects of cocaine cause many ailments that it actually claimed to cure. Lack of sleep, eating disorders, depression, and even hallucinations. Now, I don't know if you've watched television and you've seen all the pharmaceutical uh, commercials that they advertise out there today. They advertise a pill or a treatment that is supposed to relieve the symptoms of whatever it is we happen to be suffering from. But I don't know if you've noticed this, the side effects of the drug are often worse than the actual sickness itself. And many of you, sad to say, in the 1950s remember a wonder drug called thalidomide. Um, it was used to treat nausea in pregnant women, but it was also the same drug that was found to be causing uh, devastating birth defects in babies. Then there was the science of phrenology that linked the bumps on a person's head to certain aspects of individuals' personality and character, all of which, of course, has since been debunked, but that was called science then. And then there is the study of eugenics, which gained great momentum in this country at the turn of the 20th century. This was called the science of racial improvement through planned breeding. Sadly, this is a movement, I don't know if you know this, that is making a very strong resurgence in our culture today and among some of elite circles. This was the very dangerous pseudoscience that led to the racial genocide of the Holocaust. The fact is man's attempt to control the world through the limited lens of what we know is devastating. Now, I am not saying that science, all science is bad. The fact is we have been blessed by God through scientists with the cure for many diseases like smallpox, polio, tuberculosis, and many others. And we have enjoyed many great technological advances that make our life easier. What I am saying is just because something says it is scientific, it certainly doesn't mean that it is foolproof or infallible, and often quite the contrary. Because the fact is, man's wisdom goes only so far. And the source of man's wisdom, when it is good, comes from God. I think that is why we are seeing less and less godly innovation and imagination when it comes to genuine breakthroughs in our time. And with each leap in technology, we, have, we are having to deal with a massive amount of fallout. The internet has been a great and incredible boon of information, but with it, we are dealing with an increase in pornography and other harmful influences. The phone is a small handheld computer that can, we can take with us everywhere. Who would have imagined in my day especially that such a thing was ever possible? And yet we are only beginning to understand the toll that this technology is taking on our culture and on our kids. As believers, before we buy into anything new, we need to do a little research. And we shouldn't believe everything that we are told by government organizations or global industrialists who may be pushing a destructive agenda. What is it Pastor Chuck used to say? If it's true, it's not new, and if it's new, it's not true. 
1 Thessalonians 5.21 tells us we are to test all things and hold on to what is good. The word of God is given to guide us in our decision-making process, and the spirit of God will reveal to us what is good and what is from God, because the source of all truth and all wisdom is God. Proverbs 9.10 tells us that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One brings understanding. And in James 1.17, we remember James writes, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. James then concludes with this in chapter 3, verse 17, but the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering without hypocrisy, and the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Well, as we continue in chapter 4, we find that the church is experiencing some difficulties in getting along, and that is no surprise because the fact is where there are people, there are sure to be problems, even in church. I'm sure that Vicki, if she were here, would probably be able to vouch for that. Now, I was on staff at church for about 13 years, and I can tell you that working behind the scenes is not always easy. Now, you do get to see some great and remarkable things, but you also get to see some things sometimes that you'd rather not. In James 4.1, James asks and answers this question, what is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is not the source your pleasure that wage war in your members? You lust and do not have, so you commit murder. You are envious and you cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. And then in verse 3, you ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. James has been teaching us that our motives matter, that what is in our hearts, what is in our inner being is important when it comes to God's plans and God's purposes. What is the source of our words or the source of our wants? What is at the heart of our requests? When the prophet Samuel was instructed by God to go to Jesse's house and anoint the next king of Israel, if you remember, Jesse brought out seven of his eight sons. And 1 Samuel 16, it says that when Samuel saw Eliab, one of Jesse's older sons, Samuel said to himself, surely this is the Lord's anointed. But God told Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him, because the Lord does not see as man does. For man sees the outward appearance, but the Lord sees the heart. You remember that was exactly how Israel ended up with their first king, Saul. The people elected him simply because he was tall and good-looking. But he failed God, and he failed God's people. Saul wasn't interested in pleasing God. Saul just wanted to be popular with the people. If we are, to be completely honest, each of us struggles a little in this area. Oh, we might not want a lot of attention, but we still want to be acknowledged, and we still want to be recognized by others in some way. Each of us seeks the spotlight in some area of our life. Well, God directs Samuel to Jesse's youngest son, who was not even considered by his own father to be a good prospect. But when he was brought in from the field where he was attending the sheep, God tells Samuel, rise and anoint him, for he is the one. God had heard David's innermost thoughts. God saw David during those long nights of tending sheep when David was singing praises to the Lord. God watched as this young man took on a bear and a lion to defend his own family's flock. David had the heart of a shepherd, and this was the heart of his God. Now, the religious leaders of Jesus' day, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they looked good to others on the outside, but Jesus saw what other people didn't. Or if they did, they chose to ignore it. Remember what Jesus says to these men in Matthew 23, verse 27? He says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but you are filled with dead men's bones and every kind of impurity. In the same way, on the outside you appear to be righteous, but on the inside you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. Who we are on the inside matters to God. Abraham Lincoln is known for saying, you can fool some of the people all the time, and all the people some of the time, but you can't fool all the people all the time. Might I add that we can't fool God at any time. When we are petitioning God for something, we need to do a little soul searching, and we need to ask ourselves a few questions. What am I asking God for? 
and why am I asking for it? Is it to make my life easier, more comfortable, or better for me in some way? Or is it to bring glory to God? Or is it something good for someone else? Are we looking to grow in our relationship with God? Or are we just looking to please ourselves? Are we looking to remove obstacles or to remain faithful? Now, during my time as children's ministry director, we would often plan numerous events, and one of them was Talent Camp. If you've ever had anything to do with Talent Camp, you know it's a, a big undertaking. Uh, there were over 400 children and over 250 volunteers that take part in that. And this was a week-long event. So a group of us every day in the morning would gather together in the office and we would pray for each day. And one of the prayers that always bothered me, and sure enough, somebody was always uh, going to pray it, was, Lord, please help everything to go smoothly. Now, I understand that prayer. I even desire the fulfillment of that prayer. But the fact is, I happen to know that not every event or every situation or even every day is going to be easy or go smoothly. If it did, we would never learn anything about the power of God during times of trouble. We know that in this world, there will be trouble. Jesus said so in John 16, 33. Trouble, we know, is part of this life. And often God uses our trials to lead us closer to the Lord and to encourage us in our faith. So instead, it's better that we pray, Lord, when the challenges come, and they will come, please help each of us to deal with them in the power of your Holy Spirit. God will not prevent all problems but he does promise to help us through them and to stand alongside us in them. Hebrews 13.5 says, For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And also in Deuteronomy 31.6, he says, Be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be in dread, for it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. God has promised us his presence in the midst of our problems. And whenever I read that, I am reminded of three young men in the book of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Or if you like the Veggie, veggie Tales version, it's Rack, Shack, and Benny. Which I like. Well, when these young men decided to defy King Nebuchadnezzar by not worshiping the golden idol, they were told that they would be thrown into the fire. And we can read their response in Daniel 3, verses 17 and 18. It says, if we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. But even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you, your majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue that you have set up. I like what Pastor David Guzip writes. He says, they had a good understanding and appreciation of submission to God. They knew he had the power to save them from it but they also knew they must do what was right in it, even if God didn't do what they wanted or expected. These two words, even if, remind me of a song that I love by Mercy Me called Even If. And the chorus says, I know you're able and I know you can. Save through the fire with your mighty hand, but even if you don't, my hope is you alone. I know the sorrow and I know the hurt would all go away if you just said the word, but even if you don't, my hope is you alone. This is the heart, and this is the hope that pleases God. Yes, we can take our petitions to the Lord. We are supposed to take them. Philippians 4, 6 says, Be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And Jesus said in John 14, verses 13 and 14, Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. But this statement requires that what we ask must be in God's will, lest we think that we have a carte blanche in prayer or that God is obligated to give us whatever we want, whenever we want, like a genie in a bottle. So we must match this statement up against other scripture. 1 John 5, 14, and this is the confidence that we have before him that if we ask anything, and here it is, according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request which we have asked from him. Now, if your child comes to you and is asking for something that they need and that you are able to provide for them, what good parent says no just for spite? 
Jesus said, if you, despite being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father who is in heaven give good things, good gifts to those who ask him? Now, as a parent of an only child who is now an adult, I often have to remind myself not to give too much. What do I mean? Well, I happen to love, you know, I've, I've raised a son, so the mother-son thing kind of changes dynamics when they hit getting older. So you're always looking for a way to connect. You're lo always looking for a doorway in. And I love coming across something that my son would like when I'm in the stores. And there are times that I get something for him. But there are also times when I know that the purchase of that item, no matter how much he might like it, might not be good for him at that time. I tend to give too much. And if I continue to buy for him or overdo for him, then he will never learn the value of hard work or money. So sometimes I have to say no for now because he isn't ready for it or he won't appreciate it or it may somehow keep him from maturing in a given area. This is the same with God because God is a giver. And I think that there is times, there are times in our walk when he has to hold something back that we want because we aren't ready for it yet. We may have a three-year-old who wants a bicycle, but he or she is not physically able to ride it without injuring themselves, so we must wait until they are mature enough to handle the gift. If we have been praying for something, we need to first ask God if it is his will for us to have it. And if it isn't, then we need to change our prayers to align with his will. You remember when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane and he prayed, My Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. We must always leave room for God's will and be willing to abide by it. Now, the people that James is writing here, were, they were quarreling among themselves. They weren't seeking what was best for others, or they weren't wanting to do God's will. They wanted what they wanted, when they wanted it, and the way that they wanted it. It always reminds me of Veruca Salt and Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. You remember her when she said, I want it now, Daddy. The very fact that we are demanding something from God shows that we are not yet ready to receive it. Charles Spurgeon says, when a man so prays, he asks God to be his servant and gratify his desires. No, worse than that, he wants God to join him in the service of his lusts. He will gratify his lusts, and God shall come and help him to do it. Such prayer is blasphemous, but a large quantity of it is offered, and it must be the one of the most God-provoking things that heaven beholds. James then says, you ask and do not receive because you ask with the wrong motives. You want it for yourselves so that you can spend it on your own pleasure. The word for spend is the same verb used to describe the wasteful spending of the prodigal son in Luke 15. Destructive desires persist even if we pray because our prayers may be self-centered and self-indulgent. Verse 4, he says, you adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that scripture speaks to no purpose? He jealously desires the spirit which he has made to dwell in us. James uses strong language here, calling the people adulteresses. And you can see how someone in the church might be offended by this. But that is one of the many things that I like about James. He doesn't mince words. He tells it like it is. Remember, good medicine can be hard going down, but it is ultimately good for what ails us. And the fact is, whether we know it or not, we all struggle with idolatry and with adultery. Because any time that we put anything or anyone above God or in the place of God, that makes us guilty of idolatry. And it seems that as soon as we remove one idol, it is quickly replaced by another. People, prosperity, position, all tempt us to idolatry or adultery. Because if Jesus is our first love, if he is our greatest love, then all other loves in this life are to be subject to his. In the Old Testament book of Hosea, God's people, the nation of Israel, is allegorically represented as the harlot Gomer. 
There's a lovely name. She becomes the wife of the prophet Hosea. Now, Hosea gives Gomer, his wife, his love, his property, and every good thing that he has, and yet Gomer continues to chase after other lovers, giving birth to children by other men. I think how painful this must have been for Hosea, and how painful this is for God when we choose to turn our back on him and all his goodness to us and chase after things that give us temporary pleasure things that will ultimately lead to our despair and to our destruction. Now, the idols we worship today are really actually the same as they were back in the day. Satan is a master at repackaging the same product for a different generation. They worship Baal. He was the god of prosperity. We worship money, and we desire the comfort that it brings. They worship Moloch. God of power, offering their children upon his altar. How many children have been aborted upon the same altar today? They worshiped Ashtaroth, goddess of sex. Our culture is permeated by lust and desire. The idols we worship may take on different forms, but do not be fooled. They are the same today as they were then. 1 John 2.16 says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the vainglory of life, is not of the Father, but is of this world. Now, when we know this, we've talked about this a little bit, when the Bible speaks of the world in this kind of context, it is the world system that is ruled by Satan and satanic forces. We are to love people as God loves people in this world. Remember John 3.16 says, God, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But even our love for people can lead us down a road of idolatry and adultery. When I came to Christ in 1992, I, I was seeing someone. Some of you may have heard this story. I was seeing a man named Mike, and we had gone out for four years. And uh, during that time, Mike had gone out of state to train for a job with the INS. And I remember standing at the airport uh, saying to him, well, a lot can change in three months. I had no idea how much was going to change. I came to Christ during the three months that he was gone. An old boyfriend had actually witnessed to me at work, and I accepted Christ at uh, Calvary Chapel Placentia during a Wednesday night service. Well, when Mike came back from training during that time, about a month after my conversion, I was faced with a very difficult decision. Mike wanted to move in together, and the fact was we had planned to do this before he left for training, but now that I was a Christian, I knew that this was wrong. Mike and I could not resume our relationship because he wasn't a believer and because I knew that having sexual relations with anyone who wasn't my husband was wrong and it was against the word of God. When Mike came back, I went against what I knew was right and I moved in with him. And I noticed during this time that God had withdrawn his presence from me, which is strange to consider because I was so new in the Lord and yet I could sense his withdrawal. But I understood that God was not going to hear my prayers if I was going to continue living in this situation. I had, we lived in Redondo Beach. I was commuting from Anaheim to Redondo Beach, which tells you how brilliant I was. On my long drive home from work one day, I asked God to get me out of this situation because I knew I had made a severe mistake. I was living in sin, and I needed God's help to get me out. When I got home that evening, I told my boyfriend, Mike, that I was moving out that I was fully committing my life to the Lord, and that meant that we could no longer see each other. I left the next day, and I never went back, and I never saw him again. God had literally brought me to a crossroad. In one direction was my old life with Mike. I could choose that path, and I could do what I had always done, but I knew that this was, this was going against God. And in the other direction was God's path. I couldn't see down that road. I had no idea what was coming or even what was next, but I knew that it was what God wanted for me. I cannot tell you how happy I am looking back that I chose God, and I have never, want for, not for one day, regretted that decision. Each of us must come to a place in our lives where we choose who is going to run our life, who is in the driver's seat, who is ruling and reigning over every aspect of our lives. The fact is there is a battle going on for our souls, and this earth is the battlefield. 
because the world system is ruled by Satan. We are told in 1 John 5:19, it says, we know that we are from God and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. You remember when God created the world, he gave dominion in the deed over to Adam. But when Adam and Eve sinned, that deed was passed over to Satan. And since that time, he has been intent on ruining God's creation. And it was Christ on the cross that redeemed a lost world back to God. But we must choose whom we will serve. Many of you may remember a song by Bob Dylan from 1979 called, You Gotta Serve Somebody. And the lyrics go like this. You may be an ambassador to England or France. You may like to gamble. You might like to dance. You may be the heavyweight champion of the world. You may be a socialite with a long string of pearls. But you're going to have to serve somebody. Yes, indeed, you're going to have to serve somebody. Well, it may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you're going to have to serve somebody. Satan may rule much of this world for a designated period of time, but thankfully God overrules and overrides what he can do because greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. Now, I don't know how many of you have seen the movie that just came out recently called Nefarious. And it was about a convicted criminal on death row who was about to be executed and an atheist lawyer comes to visit him in prison. I don't think this is a spoiler alert. I won't tell you the end. They engage in a conversation and you find that there is a demonic presence that is speaking through the convicted prisoner. And he even tells the lawyer the way the devil works. The lawyer, an atheist, of course, doesn't believe him, and he has no idea the forces that he is dealing with or how unprotected he is from the power of darkness that is sitting across the table from him. And I came away from the movie thanking God for my salvation and also with a renewed realization that without Christ, and the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, we are all exceedingly vulnerable to the influence and even the inhabiting of demonic spirits. The fact is the only thing that stands between us and demonic possession is the person and the presence of Christ. Psalm 18.2 says, The Lord is my rock, my fortress, my shield, my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge my shield and the horn of my salvation. He is our strong tower, and we run to him to escape the darkness and the destruction of this world. If we love the things of this world, if we dabble in darkness, then the light of our lives will be diminished. If we, like Lot's wife, continue to look longingly or lovingly on what this world has to often offer, then we are at odds with God and his purpose and his people. James 4, 5 says, Or do you think that the scripture speaks to no purpose? He jealously desires the spirit which he has made to dwell in us. Now, some people don't like that the Bible describes God as a jealous God. Oprah Winfrey, the queen of worldly wisdom, certainly didn't like it. She is reported as saying that her impatience with rules, belief systems, and doctrines began when she, in her late 20s, heard a Baptist preacher say that God was jealous. Jealousy is not always or even often considered to be praiseworthy in humans. It is more nearly associated with clutching, anxious, petty, or a domineering frame of mind. But this is not the case when we speak of God being jealous for us. When we learn that God is all-knowing, all-powerful, and all-good, then we come to the realization that the Lord cannot be afflicted with insecurity, suspicion, and selfishness. The factors that poison human jealousy. Something much nobler is at work in the case of God. His jealousy is a matter of righteous indignation. The Bible calls him a consuming fire in Deuteronomy 4.24, and we are warned against worshiping other gods and false gods. The Lord, like any good husband, simply will not tolerate our dating around. But why, we may ask. For the same reason, an attending oncologist would explode when hearing that his patient hopped a plane to Timbuktu to have some shaman blow smoke up his nose to cure his cancer. And for the same reason, a noble and fulfilling wife would want her self-destructive husband to dump the hussy he's left her for 
and return home. There are simply no substitutes for truth, and God is truth, and God is love. God's jealousy is linked to his holiness. He is undefiled by sin, and he knows what is right and good because he knows himself. God is jealous when someone gives to another something that rightly belongs to him. Jealousy is a sin when it is a desire for something that does not belong to you. Worship, praise, honor, and adoration all belong to God alone, for only he is truly worthy of it. 2 Corinthians 11.2, the Apostle Paul writes, I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy, for I promise you to be to my one husband to present you as a pure virgin. Now, it is very hard to imagine as a wife being married to a man who proclaims that he loves you but allows you to date other men. We would have to question whether he really loved us or not. We cannot have a relationship with God and with this world. We cannot be fully devoted to God when we are leading a carnal life. God jealously yearns for the full devotion of our heart. Verse 6, but he, God, gives a greater grace. Therefore, it says, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Verse 9, be miserable and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to gloom. James certainly doesn't mince word, does he? We read the words of James and we have to wonder a bit at his bedside manner because James is direct and to the point. And that might make us feel just a little uncomfortable. But remember, again, good medicine doesn't always taste good or feel good. And I would rather have a doctor that tells it to me straight than one who's going to beat around the bush. Comedian Henny Youngman once quipped, when I told my doctor I couldn't afford an operation, he offered to touch up my x-rays. When it comes to our health, physical as well as spiritual, it is better that we hear what we need rather than what we want. Our good doctor, James, tells us what we need to hear, and he is direct and to the point. God is jealous for his people, not jealous like we are jealous, but his desire is that we commit ourselves completely to him, and that means that we submit ourselves completely to him because this is where we will find our best life. Sin in all its forms is like a cancer. It may start out small, but it grows and it seeks to destroy all that is good in the body. Our sin grieves God because it harms us. And the solution for our sickness is to submit ourselves into his loving care. God is opposed to the proud because pride is the root of all sin. Pride says, in essence, I know what is best for me. And then James tells us we are to resist the devil and then he will flee from you. We are not to engage the enemy in battle. That is God's job. In fact, we are even told in the book of Jude that even the archangel Michael, when he contended with Satan over the body of Moses, did not pronounce judgment against him, but instead said, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. We cannot go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the enemy and win. He is too powerful for us to fight. But the Holy Spirit gives us the ability to recognize his traps to remain steadfast and resist the temptations that he offers us. Prime example of this is found in Luke 4 when Jesus was tempted by Satan in the wilderness. Satan timed his attack. He waited until Jesus was at his weakest. Jesus had, pa had fasted for 40 days and his body was now going into starvation mode. Satan then seizes this opportunity to tempt Jesus to sin, twisting God's word to accomplish his own purpose. But with each thrust, Jesus parried with the truth of the word of God, standing strong in scripture and in the power of the Holy Spirit, saying to Satan each time, it is written. Jesus stood strong in the truth, and the devil becomes frustrated and departs from Jesus, waiting, it says, for a more opportune time. The word here for resist comes from two Greek words, stand and against. Satan can be set running by the resistance of the lowliest believer who comes in the authority of what Jesus did on the cross. When we are standing on the word of God and in the power of God, then we are given the strength of God to resist the schemes of the enemy. 
A famous ancient Christian writer named Hermas wrote, the devil can wrestle against the Christian, but he cannot pin him to the mat. The best place for us to be when the enemy attacks is as close to our Savior as possible. Verse 8, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. This always reminds me of an old movie from the 1980s. Some of you ladies may have seen it. It's called My Bodyguard. Anybody ever see that? It was about a new student named Clifford who comes to a new school and gets harassed by a bully. Clifford then decides to acquire the services of the school's most feared kid as a bodyguard. Now the kid is much bigger and much stronger than Clifford and eventually they become friends and then they take on and they defeat the bullies together. Have you ever noticed it is so much easier to take on someone strong when you have someone stronger standing in your corner? When God is for us, nothing can stand against us. In 2 Samuel 23, once again, the enemies of Israel, the Philistines had come against the nation of Israel. And David and his mighty men are doing battle with them, and we are told about one of the men named Shema. 2 Samuel 23, 11 says, Now after him was Shema the son of Agi, a Hararite. And the Philistines were gathered into an army where there was a plot of land full of lentils, beans. And the people fled from the Philistines, but Shema took his stand in the midst of the plot defended it, and struck the Philistines, and the Lord brought about a great victory. Now, it might seem insignificant to risk one's life over a hill of beans, but Shama thought otherwise. He chose to defend this patch of ground with all his might, trusting that God would give him the victory, and he found that his faith in God was rewarded. Even though Shama did not attack the enemy's land, he courageously defended the patch of land that God had given to his people. Every inch of ground that we give over to the enemy allows him to dig deeper into God's territory, infecting others with his lies. We stand strong because we know we fight a defeated foe who desires to take as many with him as possible. And then verse 9, James says, Be miserable and mourn and weep, let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to gloom. Now, we don't see this verse stamped on too many Christian greeting cards. <laughs> Not one you're going to find, if any at all. But we have to remember the solution to our sickness. We are to submit to God. We are to resist the devil. We are to draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. And then we are instructed to cleanse our hands and to purify our hearts. And we are to mourn our sin because sin affects our relationship with God. Isaiah 51, 59, 1 tells us this. Behold, the Lord's hand is not so short that it cannot save, nor is his ear so dull that it cannot hear. But your wrongdoings, your sin has caused a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. Returning again to my conversion in 1992, um, when I had made my commitment to Christ, but found myself living with my boyfriend, Mike, I became keenly aware that my prayers were not being heard by God. Yes, God heard what I was praying, but it was as if my requests were hitting a ceiling. And I came to understand that as long as I remained in that sinful situation, that God would not answer my prayers. My sin was causing a rift in my relationship with God, and it wasn't until I got right with God and remove myself from that situation that I knew that my prayers were going to be heard and answered accordingly. Solomon writes in Ecclesiastes 3, 4, there is a time to weep and a time to laugh. There is a time to mourn and there is a time to dance. And Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 4, blessed are they who mourn for they shall be comforted. Now, this sounds like a contradiction in terms. Blessed means happy, so it's literally saying, happy are you when you mourn. People who mourn don't seem to be blessed or happy. Jesus is contrasting the world's idea of happiness with true blessedness and spiritual prosperity that comes from having a right relationship with God. And the term mourn here means to experience deep grief. And this mourning has to do with grieving over our own sin. The Holy Spirit comforts those who are honest about their own sin and humble enough to ask for forgiveness and for healing. Too often, I think we become accustomed to our own sin and we choose to live with it and in the consequences that come from it. But God wants something better for us. He tells us that he came to give us life and that abundantly. 
But we can only experience that abundance when we are living in obedience to him. In John 15, Jesus says, Abide in me, and I in you. And as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him will bear much fruit. When we remain closely connected to Christ, we will live an abundant, fruit-filled life. And it is better to repent and return to mourn our sinful state than it is to seek the passing pleasures of this world. Moses found that out because in Hebrews 11 it says, Moses chose to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the temporary pleasures of sin, considering the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasure of heaven, for he was looking ahead to his reward. Psalm 30, verse 5 says, Weeping may last for the night, but a shout of joy comes in the morning, and it is better to grieve in this lifetime and live in glory in the next. Then James writes in verse 10, Humble yourself in the presence of the Lord, and he will exalt you. Now, I have found through experience that it is better to humble ourselves before God than it is to resist God in pride and have him do it for us. In Luke 14, beginning in verse 7, Jesus tells the parable um, to the invited guests at a gathering because he had noticed that some of them had been picking out the places of honor at the table. And he says to them in Luke 14, 8, Whenever you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor. For then someone more distinguished than you may have been invited by him, and the one who invited you both will come and say to you, Give your place to this person. And then in disgrace, you will proceed to occupy the last place. But whenever you are invited, take the last place, so that when the one who has invited you comes, he will say to you, friend, move up higher. And then you will have honor in the sight of all who are dining at the table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Jesus is saying it is better to take a lower place and be exalted than it is to take a higher place and have to be humbled. The fact is, being humbled hurts. Now, we all agree we love the attribute of humility, but we do not love the process it takes to get us there. God tells us we are not to seek self-promotion. We are to work hard as unto the Lord and let God raise us up when and if he sees fit to do so. Now, remember, humility doesn't mean humiliate. God wants us to be humble, but he doesn't want to humiliate us. Why does God value humility? Because the fact is there is something wonderfully freeing in being content in whatever place or position we find ourselves in. Paul tells us that godliness with contentment is great gain. Now, Paul is speaking of financial contentment in this packet, uh, passage, but there is also a contentment that comes with accepting humble circumstances, especially in regard to our Christian service. And there is also something wonderful about knowing that it is God who has raised you up instead of raising yourself up to some place of prominence or to a position. Genuine humility brings heart contentment. C.S. Lewis said, true humility is not thinking less of yourself. It is thinking of yourself less. Self-focus and self-thought often lead to greater depression. When we are God-focused and other-focused, we will find that we are more fulfilled. I love John Corson spells joy this way. Jesus first, then others, then yourself. I like this. I, Ronald Reagan was one of my favorite presidents. A placard on his desk read, There is no limit to what a man can do or where he can go if he doesn't mind who gets the credit. And if the desire to raise ourselves up comes at the expense of putting others down, then James issues this warning in verse 11. Do not speak against one another, brethren. He who speaks against his brother speaks against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge of it. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you who judges your neighbor? I don't know if you've ever heard of Alice Roosevelt, daughter of President Teddy Roosevelt. She was also a Washington socialite. And she was credited with this quote. said, if you haven't anything nice to say about anyone, come sit by me. What is it? 
about the sin of gossip that ensnares us so easily. The fact is we have all gotten caught, in up, caught up with it one time or another, and we've all looked at someone and we've all judged them. Proverbs 18.8 says, The words of a gossip are like choice morsels that go down into the innermost being. It's like that tasty morsel. It's like eating a pound of C's candy in one sitting, and it might taste good in the moment, but later on we find that it has soured in our stomach. Remember what James wrote in chapter 3, verses 8 and 9. He says, No one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men made in the likeness of God. Getting right with God results in our getting right with other people. And when we are right with other people, it will show in the way we talk to them and about them. We are not to speak evil of one another, and we are not to judge one another. The phrase here, to speak evil, is the word katalia, K-A-T-A-L-I-A. And it is the sin of those who meet in corners and gather in little groups and pass on confidential information which destroys the good name of those who are not there to defend themselves. I often think of the word in the Old Testament, murmur. Doesn't that sound like what it is? Murmur. I'm murmuring. A good way to test our speech is to ask ourselves, would I say this if the person I'm speaking about were standing here listening? We need to watch and weigh what we say. Statements like, did you hear about so-and-so? Or did you know that he or she is a so-and-so? Sometimes we spiritualize our speech as Christians by saying, oh, we need to pray for this person because... Now, that doesn't mean that we don't pray for the needs of others, but there is a fine line I have found between information and defamation of character. And we need to check our heart and our motives before we bring someone else's business up in a conversation. Now, I have found that having said something to someone about someone else, whether it is positive or negative, can often influence how that person is seen and how their actions are interpreted. Proverbs 6, 16 through 19 tells us seven things that God hates. Haughty eyes, that's pride. A lying tongue. Hands that shed innocent blood. A heart that devises wicked schemes. Feet that run swiftly to evil. A false witness who gives false testimony. And one who stirs up discord among his brothers. James 4, verse 12, James asked the question, Who are you to judge your neighbor? You know, whenever I read this, I often think of Mrs. Kravitz. Do you remember her? She was the nosy neighbor in the sitcom Bewitched. She was always peeking through her curtains, uh, trying to get the dirt on all her neighbors. I think today they're called Karens. No offense (laughs) if anybody's called Karen. Then in verse 13, he says, Come now, you who say today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. Yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and also do this or that. But as it is, you boast in your arrogance, and all such boasting is evil. Therefore, to the one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him it is sin. James in verse 12 tells us that there is only one supreme lawgiver, one supreme judge, and that is God, not us, because there is only one Lord, and that is with a capital L. If God is truly the Lord in our life, then all our plans are to be submitted to him for approval. And we do not come and go but by his word. Yes, God expects us to go about our daily business, but he reserves the right of veto. And when we are making plans, we need to include the Lord in those plans. That means we don't just tell him what we are planning on doing. We consult him on it, and we wait for him to counsel us in it. God wants to guide us in our decision-making process. Psalm 32, 8 says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way that you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Proverbs 16, 9, a man's heart plans his way, but the Lord determines his steps. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not unto your own understanding and in all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path. 
And then Isaiah 48, 17, I am the Lord your God who teaches you for your benefit, who directs you in the way that you should go. Too many times we make plans and expect God to go along with them. We want him to rubber stamp them. But God wants us to bring our plans to him, ask him what we should do, and where we should go. In 2 Kings 19, King Hezekiah receives a threatening letter from his enemy. Hezekiah did exactly what any child of God should do. He took it to the house of the Lord, and he spread it out before the Lord, asking God to show him what he should do next. The Bible tells us many things that we are to do and not to do. But there are times when we have decisions to make, and the answer is not clear to us. Do we take that new job? Do we buy that new house? Do we leave one place and go to another? Now, we have all seen this a lot over the past five years. Most of us know someone who has moved out of state recently, and probably for very good reason. Now, for the past four years, my husband and I have been praying about this because we see also what is happening in this state. But we also have to realize that our vision is very limited. God sees much further down the road than we do. He sees what will happen tomorrow, and he sees what's going to happen over the next year. And because he sees, he knows the right place for us to be at the right time. I see this principle in the book of Ruth. When Naomi and her husband Elimelech are facing a famine in Bethlehem, ironically called the house of bread, they decide to take their two boys and move to Moab. Now, Moab was enemy territory. But the rumor was that there was food there. Now, it may have seemed like a very logical response to this crisis, but nowhere in this book do I read that they sought the Lord or that God had told them to go. The family ends up moving to Moab to save their family, and yet Naomi ends up losing her husband and both of her sons. Now, to be fair, the boys probably would have died in Israel or Bethlehem if they had stayed because one was called Malon, which means sickly, and the other was called Chilean, which means wasting or pining. These were not robust boys. But the fact was, in trying to save her family, Naomi loses them all in a foreign land. Not to say that they wouldn't have died in Bethlehem, but Naomi would have been surrounded by a circle of family and friends. She would have faced this crisis with a community who knew her and loved her. The fact is God doesn't always prevent the crisis, but he wants us to be in the best possible place when it occurs. This was revealed to me many years ago in a small situation. I had a flat tire on the 57 freeway. At that time, I had lived in, Anna, in the Upland, and I commuted to Anaheim for work, so I was on the freeway a lot. And I don't know if you remember, they used to have call boxes on the side of the road, those big yellow call boxes. Remember those? Well, when I, I had a flat tire, I, I called the number that was given on the call box for roadside assistance, and I was informed by the person that came out um, that I was on a stretch of road that was covered by state funding for auto breakdowns. So my repair was not only fast, it was also free. God did not prevent me from breaking down, but I was in the best possible place when it happened. I have found from scripture that when God wants someone to move, he tells them, Abraham, Moses, Gideon, Jonah, Mary, and Joseph were all instructed by God to go. God didn't make them guess, and he doesn't make us guess when it's time to go or whether we should go. God will give us the green light, and he will guide us all along the way. What kind of parent would I be if my son came to me asking for advice or wisdom, and I said to him, I want you to guess? You may be thinking, I've asked God, and he is not saying anything. Then his silence tells us that we are to watch and we are to wait. God gives us three answers to our prayers. Yes, no, and wait. Where and when we go has everything to do with God's timing. He is the one that we look to for guidance and for direction. And we might have an idea, we might even have a plan but these must be taken to the Lord and laid before him, and we must get the go-ahead before we make the move-ahead. 
You remember when Nehemiah was told about the difficulties of his people in Jerusalem? He wept because God had given him a burden for his people. But Nehemiah didn't pack up and he didn't run off. He was in a place of prominence as a cupbearer. He had responsibilities where he was. His body may have been in the palace, but his heart was with his people. Nehemiah prayed and he fasted and he waited for God to tell him what to do and also to open up the way. So ladies, that is what we need to do. We need to take our requests. We need to take our desires. We need to take our hopes and our help to the Lord. And we need to ask him to show us. Because God sees not that which is temporal like we do. He sees what is eternal. Because he says to us, yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. The image here is like when you're in cold weather. You know how you breathe out and then it's gone. So we can trust the Lord. We may be making temporary plans, but God is making eternal plans. So we need to trust him. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word, your Holy Spirit, and that you have a heart to guide us. You want to guide us, Lord God. But there are times in the midst of it we become confused or in a hurry to move. And we know, Lord, that you are never in a hurry because you are never worried. And so, Father, help us to follow your good plan, your good word, your good will, Lord. And in the process, we see your glory, Lord. And we have a testimony to tell others that we know that our God is at work in his people. And so, Father, I thank you. I pray that you would speak to the ladies during their group time. I pray that you would bless them, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, ladies. These are interested in talking to Tammy for a little while. She's right here. <laughs> If you are in Marianne Dressendorfer's group, uh, you guys were combined last